talking about how pharmaceutical companies are using big data to run their businesses in addition to doing an A little bit about our company. We're, uh, my company is called Mark Logic, and we're uh, uh, the largest NoSQL vendor in, in, from a revenue perspective. I guess I'm going to push this further away. Um, we we are uh, we've been in the pharmaceutical space for about a year now, and five of the top ten pharmaceutical companies are using our, our systems. The uh, company, the system, the 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 management of the company. And I'd like to just point you out to Gary Bloom, is is uh, ran Oracle's database division for a dozen years before he joined uh, Mark. So what I'm here to talk about a, a little bit is the current architecture that most large organizations use. Yeah, maybe I should stand on this side here. Can you guys hear me better? Yeah. Um, current large architectures that most organizations use. All right. Let's try this. Does this work? All right. All right, so, and again, I guess, uh, can you up the mic? All right, perfect. Most large organizations have two different major kinds of architectures that they use. To run their businesses, they use enterprise application integration or uh, enterprise services, bu service buses, service-oriented architectures, those sorts of things. These days, uh, as Burke just identified, microservices is, is a much better place to go because the smaller the service, the more reusable it becomes. But these are all very much focused on running the business and on exchanging messages between different data silos. They do nothing about solving the underlying problem of having hundreds, if not thousands, or tens of thousands of data silos in your organization. Right. The next major piece of the puzzle is the enterprise data warehouse. This has been around for since the late 80s, early 90s. And, and the idea behind this is to get data from all of your different businesses and provide dashboards on top of this so that you can do analytics to figure out what you should be doing from changing your business perspective. Right? These are the observe the business functions. A simplified diagram of this look something like this, where you have on the left-hand side the service-oriented architecture, which you're using to run your business, but note you still have a lot of different silos here. And then uh, on the right-hand side, uh, uh, you have the observation of the business. Between them, you have a lot of things going on to connect the running of your business to your observing of the business. And really, let's take a deep dive into each of the pieces of the puzzle. One is a lot of time is spent, in fact, 60% of the time uh, is spent in, in projects just getting the data from point A to point B, right? And, and this includes analytics, discovery, research, real world evidence, all of those kinds of things. The other piece of the puzzle that you see is that you have a lot of people and organizations spend a lot of effort in master data management. Why did they spend that effort? Because you can see on this side you have way too many data silos, and on this side you have data warehouses that are built to answer certain questions, and then you finally realize that, no, I, I need more questions to be answered, so I'm going to build specialized data marts. And, and the, the need for moving data around and the need for understanding which data is the master data becomes very, very important. As your data changes, as your data set sizes grow, figuring out what data to distribute to whom and securely is also a very huge issue, right? The data warehouses typically are cross line of business, but what you have going on here is you have uh, the need to decide up front in a data warehouse, what are the questions I'm going to try to answer for running my business? Then you have to say, okay, this is the schema, this is the the database that I'm going to put together for answering those questions, right? Then you got to figure out, okay, how do I take that ETL 
how do I take the where do I take the data from my my operational databases and and ETL it into this database, right? So so that whole process is a very long and arduous process, and then inevitably you always get the questions wrong, right? So you start saying, okay, now we need to build specialized data marts around the new questions that we need to answer because the old database is just not fast enough to do that. And so you start building data marts here. Uh, and again, on the service-oriented architecture side, you, you have a very clean way of now connecting your different data silos together. But you are all, that's all you're doing. You're just connecting and providing access to the data. You're really not putting the data in a single place where you can keep track of it across all of your businesses. So, so what that leads to over time is, is the fact that as your data sets grow, as your data warehouses become more complicated, the distance between the real-time stuff that's happening in running my business to the, to the stuff that the CEO and the VPs need to know and understand to change and operate the business gets larger and larger. Um, you know, on here we're talking these days real time. Over here we're talking, if we're lucky, daily, nightly, or uh, quarterly, depending on how, how tough it is to get those data sets, right? And, and ETL is really the biggest part or the trouble of it because it's everywhere. It's all over the place in your enterprise. Your OLTP systems need to be ETL'd into your uh, data warehouses. Your data warehouses need to be ETL'd into your data marts. Your data warehouses and your OLTP systems run out of gas. They need to be ETL'd into archives. And God forbid you have a regulatory question that comes up that, that goes back into your archive that you have to resurrect, right? Th those take days, weeks, or months to do, right? Um, then you have uh, reference data that's coming in that is changing, right? Our, our, our OMOP data sets, our MEDRA data sets, all those kinds of data sets are not standing still. They change. Every quarter I get new versions of those. What do I do with them? I have to ETL them into the system. I have to update my systems to handle the new data sets. And then you have now, we're talking about all, all sorts of real world evidence that are coming in, not only through, not only through healthcare systems, but also uh, consumer generated stuff, device generated stuff, all these sorts of things are bringing in lots of data in, in lots of different ways, right? The typical enterprise right now is still trying to handle that through ETL. And if you keep trying to handle it through ETL, you're just going to, uh, I guess, suffer under the load of, of ETL. And, and, and ETL is going to consume more and more and more of your enterprise resources. And that's just the way it's been over the last 30, 30 years or so. So let's take a, another sort of look at, at what an enterprise looks like. Typically, you're going to have an enterprise where you have uh, line of business type of databases, right? So a database that's very focused on pharmaceuticals, a database that's focused on medical devices. But you also have cross-functional databases like a database only for marketing, a database for sales, and, and those databases don't talk to each other. How did we get into this place, right? The, the, the simple answer is that in each of these lines of business and in each of these business functions, people look for and find solutions. And yes, they find canned made solutions that then they start modifying. But canned made solutions really means I've got a new data silo, right? That's really what you end up doing when you do this sort of thing. So the other sort of uh, solution set that people have been looking at is to start putting all of the data together in a large database or, or a large file system, Hadoop, right, is, is the typical way people have been going. But I would argue that Hadoop is generating, generally speaking, if not done right, a lot more data silos. Yes, the data silos are on the same place, and yes, you, you, you can move the data between those data silos much more rapidly, but you do have data silos. So in Hadoop, for example, if I want to do full text search, I'm going to bolt on Elasticsearch, or I'm going to bolt on Solar, and, and I'll be able to do that. But now, guess what? I have to get that data from my Hadoop file system into each of those applications and create and, and, and sort of synchronize new incoming data with the new indexes that are in my full text search. 
if I want to do graph databases, I have to set up a separate service. If I want to do geospatial databases, I have to set up a separate service. If I want to do uh, key value pair, high performance in-memory calculations, I have to set up another service, right? So by the time I'm done setting up a Hadoop cluster with these services, I, and I've done this before, <laughs> um, I had about 40 different services that I had to keep up and running, and I had to have maybe, I would say, uh, at 10 different sorts of ETL systems to move data between them. And I actually had to build my own custom inventory tracking system, right? If I move 100,000 records from here to there, right, when three quarters of my MapReduce jobs work, great, I've got three quarters of the data there, but what about the one quarter that didn't work, right? So I actually have to keep track of each record by record, how many made it, which ones didn't make it, how do I send them back through the system? Those sorts of things become very, very time consuming and important. And one of the things that I'd like to point out is the previous speaker also mentioned that a lot of work is done doing the plumbing, right? Unfortunately, when you get a, a Hadoop system, you're really un under the hood starting to build from scratch functionality that you need to operate your business and to do your analytics. So, so what that does is if you look in the center, we have people really. People connect the different lines of business together. People in the Hadoop system figure out what pieces of the puzzle have to go together and where they need to live, right? Um, and once you have these silos, you have ETL. And, and like I said, you know, the people are really the key for gluing all of these systems together. And people is not a way, place you want to be as your data sets grow, as the number of data silos grow. You really want to automate it. You want to actually flip the system on your head and say, well, I want the people on the outside consuming the data. I want the data in the middle all together as much as I possibly can do it, right? Now, now then the question is, OK, how do I do that? Uh, and what are the benefits of doing that? Well, one of the pieces of the puzzle is I have to have data models that are very flexible. We talked about the data models just earlier in terms of one data model to rule them all. It just doesn't work, right? So you need the ability to, to take in data models that come in. You need that flexibility. You need to be data centric. You need to start thinking of your data separate from your applications. Your, your data should be your data. It should be governed by a data governance team. It should be accessed securely by a data governance, by, by defined through the data governments. And you're right, those are very much people processes that you have to come through to, to figure that out. But, but it's really important that, that, that you, you, you spend the effort and time within an organization to do that. This new pattern has been identified by Gartner over the last uh, few years as the operational data hub. And, and so what are some of the characteristics of an operational data hub? The operational data hub has to be operational. So what does that mean? It needs to be real time. It needs to be transactional. If I have an accounting system where I'm moving a million dollars worth of inventory from location A to location B, I want to make sure that that inventory got moved properly and recorded properly, right? Um, but on the other hand, it also needs to handle varied workloads. I need to be able to say, hey, let's hammer this thing with a 24-hour a, a long job because I want to do certain kinds of analytics and see certain kinds of results against it. The, the system needs to be read-write. It needs to be two-way so consumers can affect it, change within the system in addition to just being an observational system. right? The context of the data is extremely important. What does that mean when I say context of data? I need to know where the data came from. I need to know what ontologies, what systems this data belongs to. I need to understand the relationship of my chemicals to my drugs, to my marketing name. All of those become semantic concepts that are very important that I need to keep track of. If I have the data together in a central place, then I'm not doing that much ETL. But I still need to start figuring out how to enrich the data and harmonize the data in ways that my enterprise can use. 
And so we'll talk a little bit about that in the following slide set. Also, now that I'm starting to bring the data together, right, not just a terabyte, but a petabyte or two petabytes or three petabytes of data, I need to figure out how to secure it. I need to figure out how to lock it down. I need to figure out how to lock down not only data access, but also data change. Um, and so those become very important. And you can't do this in a big bang. It just doesn't work, right? You can't go to your CEO and say, hey, throw out all the infrastructure we spent the last 40 years building and start from scratch. It just doesn't work that way. So it has to be complementary. It has to be able to connect into your existing data sets. You have to be able to do a combination of what I would call books of record from your source systems that stay at books of record but are in real time synchronized to this operational data hub or in batch depending, and usually the limitation is not the operational data hub, the limitation is the source system and how quickly it can react to the data sets and requests that are being put on it by the end users. So, so what does an operational data hub look like from a data flow perspective? And, and uh, I've, in the past, two and a half years I've seen a lot of different customers do this and the pattern is exactly the same over and over and over again. So I'm just gonna talk about the pattern and not talk about use cases first and then we'll talk about some use cases in the pharmaceutical space. So the core pattern is step one, bring the data in as is. And again, this means you have to be totally schema agnostic. If I have 10 different schemas for the same kind of data, that's cool, doesn't matter, don't harmonize it, just bring it in. If you have in the data hub the ability to search for anything you want, just the way Google searches on the web, right, then a lot of the discovery that you can do is still there because you can discover it from a content perspective, not from a schema perspective. So for example, if I brought in a patient with my name, Imran Chaudhry, from 10 different EHR systems into my real world evidence database, right? I could still find that content just by searching for Imran as the first name and Chaudhry as the last name. And I could even say, I don't even know if it's a first name or a last name. I'm just gonna search for Imran and Chaudhry as two tokens and a date of birth of 1966. So now you guys know how old I am. Um, uh, but, but the deal is, is that, that once I search for those tokens, that's enough specificity for me to find that person across all of my databases. And then I can go, oh, you know, in this database, first name is FN. In this database, it's called first name. In this database, it's first underscore name. Once I have that capability, I can start understanding my data way better than I used to be able to do, right? So content-based search, just the way you would have Google do it, right? Then the question becomes, okay, now that I have that data, what do I wanna start doing with it? How do I wanna make it such that across the enterprise, my software developers don't need to know FN versus first name versus first underscore name, right? So what you can start doing is you can start doing what we call enrichment and harmonization. This is a very, and, 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 and we have purposefully said, hey, stop calling this master data management because it isn't, because this data is gonna live in multiple data sources, but you can still find it the exact same way across your enterprise, right? Um, and I'll give you some examples of that enrichment process. Once you have that data enriched, then you have two, two different ways of, of exposing it. You can expose it the, the, just the enriched data sets and say, this is the data set that I'm going to look at and expose. Or you can say, well, no, I want to have the raw data available to my data scientists as well as the harmonized versions of the data, right? And, and those are choices that you can make and those go back to data governance and, and, and use cases that you need to put together. So an example of this might be you know, three or four, three different schemas of the same type of content. First step is just bring it in. And then the next step is to iteratively harmonize that data. So what do I mean by iteratively harmonize the data? Again, if the first step of the process is for this particular application, I'm just, I just need demographics, fine. Let's just find the demographics in all of the content pieces and promote them to the envelope piece so that everybody can find the demographics the same way across all of my data sets, right? 
An example of uh, enrichment might be I have an address. The address is the location of a site that I'm, I'm enrolling patients in. And I want to start doing geospatial analytics on it. Well, addresses don't lend themselves very readily to doing geospatial polygons. Latitude and longitude do. So if I could take the address here and enrich it by putting it up here, uh, now my enterprise has access to the latitude and longitudes of all of the addresses, and it doesn't care what the actual specific address was when I start doing my searches and filters. The other piece of the puzzle is all of the metadata. When did the real world event happen? Did the patient make a visit in, in a clinic at a certain date, right? Um, did he not make that visit? When did we know about it? When did that data flow into the central operational data hub? Which source did this data come from? Which software version of the operational data hub pulled the data in from the source and put it right here in this particular tag, right? So those are all the very cool sorts of metadata that you can start associating. And the flexibility of having whatever you want as being the metadata associated with your data tied directly to the data really provides strong lineage and governance and makes it very easy for people to understand where the data is coming from. The last piece of the puzzle is, is semantics. Triples and relationships that humans know about, that computers have a really hard time with, are things that you really want to start embedding into your data. Uh, examples of that might be that Bayetta has, a, has a, a generic name called Xenotide. Bayetta has an FDA ID of 303 whatever. Right? Bayetta is a class of incretin mimetics. Right? So those are things that you can put in as relationships. What's interesting is that if you start putting the relationships right in with the content, then guess what? When you delete the content, the relationships go away too. So managing your relationships, your semantic understanding of your content within your content itself is a very interesting way to go. And a lot of uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies are, have been heading down that route. So uh, I don't know how many people here know about semantics, but I figured I'd just give a real quick example of it. Uh, and here we might have uh, something like a CAT scan is, is a radiology procedure. Neuroblastomas can be observed in CAT scans. They're a type of cancer located in an adrenal gland, which is located near a kidney. So this is just an ontology that could be put together totally independent of any data set that, that exists, right? But on the other hand, we could have a radiology report. And in that radiology report, we could embed just two pieces of the semantic content that we're talking about. And, and it might be that the procedure performed by the radiologist was a CAT scan and that the consulting physician observed a neuroblastoma. Well, then the question is, could I still find this document if I were looking for something like a radiology procedure for a cancer near a kidney? Right? And the answer is yes. Because you have this reference data that's, that's out there, you can tie it in with, with the, the actual content and the semantics, semantic meaning of the content as you know you need that semantic meaning. So, so I, I, I often get asked, OK, so are you a semantics insight AI cognitive computing engine? Or, or, or how does this work, right? How do you, what's the division of labor? And I think the next slide that I have really, really presents that well. Operational data hubs need to be the things that are described in the previous slide. They need to be real time. They need to be content sensitive. They need to have the semantics. They need to be secure. And, and that's what an operational data hub does. It doesn't do the cognitive computing, the insight generation. But the insights that get generated are very nicely stored in graphs, right? So you, you, can, you can definitely say, OK, weight gain, weight gain by a cardiac patient within three days of, you know, of several pounds is, is, is highly predictive of rehospitalization, for example, right? And, and that, that insight can be generated here, but you can store that sort of triple set of, of known events that can happen, and then you can use those in real time 
to find patients that fit that criteria. As the weight is flowing in from the weighing machine, right, in real time, you can go, okay, if it hits this, this, and this, because these are defined triples that we've put together, then we've got it, we need to send out an alert, right? So that's kind of the, the place of operational data hubs versus analytics. The other very interesting piece of the puzzle is on the operational data hub side, is normally when you're, oh, am I running? I'm running close, right? <laughs> okay, um, so all right. Uh, uh, I will just jump to the use cases really quickly, sorry. I, I had practiced this, but I was definitely a lot faster when I practiced it. <laughs> um, so, so in terms of use cases for an operational data hub, we have, uh, and we've, uh, I've actually seen in the marketplace, right, our identification of medicinal products. So being able to take data from a lot of different places together, uh, running real world evidence. So with real world evidence, you get it in way too many different formats. So how to harmonize it and keep it together. Um, another really interesting on the real-world evidence side is you can actually watch what your scientists are searching for and store that in the same database and use that to predict what they will want to see in the future, right? So re really interesting stuff. Competitive 360, being able to look at any sort of an interesting piece of the puzzle uh, and look at all different parts of the business object from different ways of, of bringing that data in. Uh, clinical trial operations, you have CROs, uh, CTMS systems, you have healthcare data, you have enrollment criteria, all that needs to be combined. All that typically comes from different sources. And then um, records retention and auditing is a big piece of the puzzle. Thanks. Great. Thank you much. Is there, we have time for one question. We'll go about a minute over to do a question if there is one. Right here. All right. So a question on the, on the triples. Mm -hmm. uh, so two triples reduce the sort of the contextual information that you might have um, when you store a document, distill a document and store it as a, as a list of triples, as opposed to directly reading a document using, say, a cognitive system. Right. So, so I, I'm not arguing storing your, your whole document as triples. I'm only arguing storing insights and relevant concepts within a document as triples. Right. So definitely no shredding of your data sets. I totally would not do that. <laughs> Terrific presentation, Dr. Chaudhry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you could, uh, this speaker set on this side is not working.